This is Howard Langer in New York. We are going to take you to Washington, D.C. to meet Justice William O. Douglas via closed circuit television. Who is this man, William O. Douglas? How did he get here? William Douglas was born October 16, 1898, in the town of Maine, Minnesota. It was the year of the Spanish-American War. The United States was emerging as a great world power. At the age of three, William Douglas was stricken with polio. It was feared he might die, or at best, never walk again. He lived. He lived to climb mountains. When William Douglas was six, his father, who was a Presbyterian missionary, died. Young William Douglas attended Yakima High School in the state of Washington. After graduating Whitman College, he went back to Yakima High as an English teacher. In 1922, William Douglas worked his way across the country to enroll at Columbia Law School in New York. He later graduated second highest in his law class. He became a law professor. In 1934, he was called to Washington by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to join the Securities and Exchange Commission. In 1939, President Roosevelt named him to the Supreme Court. Here is Justice Douglas now in the Supreme Court chambers. He's sitting back in his chair and looks at you across his huge book-laden desk. He looks very well, his face is tan, and rugged, his eyes sparkle. Behind him through the window, you can see the Capitol Dome. It's white and shining in the Washington sun. And down in the street, the heavy Washington traffic is roaring by. As you see around the walls in his office here are pictures of former Supreme Court justices. On the wall directly in front of him is a picture of Lincoln. Justice Douglas, what is the function of the Supreme Court in America? Well, there are two main functions of the Supreme Court. One is to interpret the uh, laws that Congress uh, passes and to supervise the administration of justice in the federal courts. What are the federal courts? There are, there are three federal courts. Uh, the district court, where the cases start, the court of appeals, to which appeals from the district courts are, are taken, and then the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court has supervision over, over those federal courts. What other roles does the Supreme Court have? Uh, the second uh, role, main role of the Supreme Court is to uh, sit in review on uh, state, uh, state court decisions that involve the federal constitution. Uh, we're sort of uh, what some people have called a referee, uh, the referee of the federal system. What does the court decide as referee? Uh, our court has the final word on the constitutionality of state legislation that uh, touches on the federal constitution. And it was thought that that was an important function for the court to perform uh, so that uh, there would be a, a uniformity in the application of the uh, and interpretation of the federal constitution throughout the country. Does the Supreme Court have any role in promoting social equality? No, our court deals only with actual cases or controversies, actual litigation between people. We have no power to issue rules and regulations like uh, some of the administrative agencies. Uh, we can only decide actual cases and controversies between individuals, and our decision goes only to an adjudication of the disputes between them. Which Supreme Court justice has had the greatest influence on you? Well, that's very hard to say. Uh, uh, I have had uh, personal contact with many in my 19 years, and, and before that, when I was studying law and teaching law and practicing law, I uh, read many decisions and uh, biographies of, of judges. I think probably one of our greatest judges in all history is uh, Charles Evans Hughes, who was Chief Justice when I came on the court. I served with him about three years. What qualities in him did you admire? Uh, I think he was uh, preeminent in the field of civil liberties and uh, was a very bold, courageous, uh, judge who saw clearly when it came to human rights, civil rights, the rights of minorities, uh, and, and so on. I think that uh, probably Charles Evans Hughes had as much influence as any other single judge. 
Justice Douglas, you are considered by many to be one of the outstanding champions of civil liberties in America today. What strides have we made in this field since the end of World War II? Well, I think uh, every generation uh, uh, needs education in the fundamentals of American government. Every generation comes to the problems uh, that face us uh, fresh, uh, with a new start, with a new look. I think that uh, this oncoming generation is, uh, knows, is more aware of the importance of civil liberties than perhaps my generation was. I think there has uh, developed, by and large, a degree of tolerance in America that did not exist 30 or 40 years ago. Tolerance for minorities, for unorthodox points of point of view for for uh, for, for uh, all classes of, of thought and all races and religions and creeds i think that uh, looking back over a period of 30 40 years there's been considerable progress made in that connection what is a typical week schedule in the life of a supreme court justice well uh we have the mornings for uh for work in the office or in our chambers uh, uh getting ready for the cases that will be argued that afternoon uh, and for catching up with correspondence and doing research and working on opinions. At 12 o'clock, we sit. We sit from uh, 12 o'clock until 2 o'clock. We recess at 2 o'clock for 30 minutes for lunch. We come back at 2.30 and we sit until 4.30. 4 and then we recess for the day. Uh, by the time uh, you get your desk cleaned up, and all the chores done and uh, the reading uh, completed that has to be completed for tomorrow's work, you probably leave the office about uh, 6 or 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night. Is that the routine throughout the month? Well, that is the routine for, uh, for two weeks out of uh, each month because we sit two weeks and then we recess two weeks. Uh, in the recess, uh, we um, uh, work on opinions that have been argued in the previous two weeks. While we're sitting, we have a conference at the end of each week and uh, discuss the cases that have been argued and vote on the cases that have been argued, and then the opinions are assigned for writing. How is the voting done? Is that done behind closed doors? Yes, we have a, just the nine of us uh, meet in conference, and, uh, and we take up each case in order, and the Chief Justice presides, and the, his views are stated by him, and then the discussion proceeds by seniority. Justice Douglas, during your lifetime, you've come close to death a number of times. Did any of these incidents frighten you into being less adventurous? Well, no, these uh, uh, little incidents that uh, happen to everyone, whether in traffic or in the mountains, are a part of living. Uh, the uh, accidents or incidents that have uh, been close to accidents that have happened to me have been in the mountains. But the mountains, I don't think, are nearly as da dangerous as, uh, as uh, crossing a street in a busy city in America. <laughs> Speaking about mountains, you once wrote a book about men and mountains. Why are you so intrigued about mountains? Do they symbolize something special to you? Well, I suppose they, they do. I, I suppose they symbolize something a little different to everyone. The mountains are, uh, are, are somewhat of a challenge. Uh, to some people, it's the ocean that is the challenge to uh, sail the, uh, the boat around the point or to win in, win in the race or to uh, <clears throat> get the diving championship. To others, it's the, uh, it may be, uh, well, the polio case, it's learning to walk again uh, <clears throat> without help. Uh, it may be uh, the, uh, the the boy out, out for track who wants to uh, break the world's record, uh, the four-minute uh, barrier and for the mile, and so on. Uh, each of these things has a, a challenge uh, to the individual, and the mountains uh, are just another form of challenge. You can test yourself and your strength, see how good you are, see how much endurance you have. And uh, then the reward, of course, at the top of a, of a uh, alpine mountain is very great because you're, you're right on top of the universe. You have traveled all over the world, including areas visited by few Westerners, such as Tibet. How did people differ in the areas you visited? Well, that's a pretty large question. Uh, uh, and it would, uh, it's not uh, susceptible of a short answer. 
Uh, one or two things I might uh, comment upon briefly. In, in the first place, uh, the uh, lesson that travel teaches you is that people are, are people pretty much the world around, that people have pretty much the same ambitions, they have the same motivations, the same idealism, the same kind of drive, they have the same uh, uh, spiritual nature. Uh, travel emphasizes that uh, the human race is one big brotherhood. Uh, we tend to uh, get isolated one from the other, and look upon other people's with suspicion and mistrust. Uh, that is the great importance of travel and interchange of students and, and uh, uh, to uh, go abroad, to stay abroad a while, to get to know other civilizations that are as fine as ours so that we can come on a more understanding basis with the peoples, uh, with the peoples of the world. The second thing that I've noticed about the peoples of the world is that they have a quite a vast misunderstanding of America. In what ways are we being misunderstood by peoples abroad? America has been identified more with, uh, with military means and ends and uh, ambitions and aims in their eyes. America has been uh, interested in, uh, in uh, the big grants of uh, foreign aid and so on. Uh, so they've come to identify America with things uh, military and with dollars, not with uh, warm-hearted friendship and understanding and sympathy, uh, with ideas of freedom and liberty. In your estimation, have we been gaining or losing friends abroad? We've uh, not gained uh, many friends. We've been in the process more of losing them. Uh, we haven't uh, carried our ideas of liberty and freedom abroad to, to, any, great, to any great extent. Uh, at least that is the uh, impression that uh, you get when you travel to Southeast Asia and the Middle East and Northern Africa. Uh, America there seems to be uh, cold and distant and aloof. And uh, the, uh, one of the great problems of this generation is to carry uh, to the world, to the peoples of the world, the ideas of our, that what we stand for is human freedom and human dignity, that we put uh, hum humanity ahead of guns and dollars, and that and we have a common bond with the people of the world. That's our big problem for this generation, I think. Do you have any idea as to how this can be done? Yes, in the, it, uh, it's a matter of uh, formulating our foreign policy in those, in those terms, in uh, changing uh, the attitudes of our, of our newspapers and uh, inducing uh, more, more people to travel, to go abroad, to teach in schools, go abroad to study as students, come to know these civilizations and carry the message of America, which is the great message of the Bill of Rights and the Dec Declaration of Independence. Those are the values that people in all the countries of the world cherish very highly. Do you think then that a study of American history is important to the American youngster today? Oh yes, yes indeed. History is uh, history in the humanities. And poetry are probably the most uh, important subjects that a young person can take because those are the things that tie the peoples of the world together, reach the common denominator among all the peoples of the world. Justice Douglas, if you had a chance to speak to the youth of America, what would be your message to them? Well, I would uh, say to the young people of America, uh, first learn to live uh, boldly and, and adventurously. Uh, get rid of all the fears that uh, slow people up and inhibit, inhibit, inhibit them. Uh, <clears throat> come to the world with uh, an open mind and get to study it and to know it. Uh, <clears throat> don't be afraid of it. Uh, travel, travel freely and as much as you can get to know the peoples of the earth and come on understanding terms with them. Uh, you'll find <clears throat> the earth a very exciting place to live once you get on an understanding basis with it, but you can't get on an understanding basis with it unless you are willing to live boldly and adventurously. Thank you very much.
justice douglas.